thank you for yeah so thank you for inviting me for the talk um yeah so if you have any question maybe you would like to speak up during the talk so that uh because i cannot really see the hand raising um yeah, so um, today I'm gonna cover several topics as related to the ground-based gravitational wave observations. And um, before I start, I would like to, let me see, hold on. Yeah, so before I start, I would like to define things very clearly. Um, since I'm gonna use some cartoon um, um, throughout my talk, so whenever you see a uh, blue ball on the left hand side, then that is a black hole, believe me. And if you see an orange ball on the right hand side, then that is a uh, neutron star. And basically, these two type of stars, they made of all the um, gravitational wave sources I'm going to cover today. Let's say now you have two black holes. They uh, rotate around each other. And that's what we call the in spiral phase. During this in spiraling phase, they also emit gravitational wave. And at this period, the, um, the frequency and also the amplitude of the gravitational wave more or less stay as a constant. The amplitude and frequency only goes up till the almost the end of this in spiraling when the um, the orbit of the, the binary shrink and then all the way till the end they merge. So at the uh, merger, at the, at when the um, two stars they merge, then that is when the gravitational signal becomes the maximum and also the frequency uh, goes up. And then after the merger, there will be a, a very short period of time for the system to kind of stabilize itself. That's what we call the ring down phase. So basically, the in spiral, the merger, and ring down phase, that is the three major components for gravitational signals coming from any binary mergers. So that's the three basic components. Let's say now, this kind of signal, they arrive at Earth, they are captured by the uh, LIGO Virgo detectors. There's also a, a, a picture of our interferometer, that's our detector. Let's say it hit our detector, then um, the signal will uh, look something like this. So this is just one way for us to represent our signal on our monitor. This is plotted in the time and frequency frame. So as you can see, at the earlier phase, that's the early time, the in spiral phase, the frequency of the uh, gravitational signal stay as a constant. And then as time goes by, the signal become um, brighter and brighter. That means also means the amplitude of the signal is going up. And then the signal end at the uh, merger and ring down, that is the last phase when the frequency goes up, the uh, amplitude also reach kind of the maximum. And uh, what we do is that we take this kind of signal we receive, we try to reconstruct the gravitational wave waveform underlying uh, within it. And there are a lot of physical parameter we could uh, reconstruct from this kind of signal. For example, one very important uh, parameter we would like to reconstruct is the mass of the system. So now I'm labeling uh, the plot in terms of the solar mass. Let's say these two black holes, they are around 30 solar mass. And after they merge, they become around 60 solar mass bigger black holes. And for this kind of binary black holes mergers, so far we are already have more than 40 of them, these kind of binary black holes mergers. They have a variety of, of different masses, maybe go all the way down to say around five solar mass and up to, I cannot say how, how high it is, but maybe above 50 solar masses. Um, so um, just generally speaking, these LIGO Virgo black holes, they could be um, more massive than those uh, stellar mass black holes observed in the electromagnetic observation, which all lies uh, roughly below 20 solar masses. So LIGO-Virgo do capture larger black holes. 
On the other hand, we could also have uh, smaller masses objects such as the neutron star. Two neutron stars, they merge into probably the end product still a black holes. And for this kind of binary neutron star mergers, we already capture uh, roughly like four and half of them. And they are saying in half because um, for some of the candidate we, we capture, we were not quite sure whether they are really a signal or uh, they are noise. So we um, assign some probability to each candidate. And that's why when you add them up, they are not um, an integer. So we have a few of binary neutron star mergers. As you can see, we do have a lot more binary black holes mergers than uh, binary neutron star merger being detected so far. However, um, these binary neutron star mergers, they are uh, extremely interesting for us because they also come with electromagnetic um, counterpart. So as you uh, all know, I'm sure that the very first binary neutron star merger, the GW17 OA17, these a binary neutron star merger come with, say, short gamma ray bursts, come with Kionova emission. In contrast, we do have a lot of binary black holes mergers, and uh, people did try to look for the EM signature coming with it. However, we don't have any uh, solid detections, uh, solid EM counterpart detection coming with binary black holes merger yet. So although we have a lot of them, they are dim, they are dark. Okay, and because of this big difference of whether they have uh, an electromagnetic counterpart or not, the way we are gonna use this system to do science, for example, doing cosmology, is gonna be different. And we'll come to this uh, later in the talk. As you can imagine, if we can have binary neutron star merger and binary black holes merger, then of course we can have one black hole and one neutron star, they merge into a slightly bigger black hole. This kind of neutron star black holes merger so far, LIGO Virgo also have um, a couple of um, candidate detection. So we don't, we haven't announced um, a, a solid detection yet, but we already announced several candidates. And for this kind of neutron star black holes merger, um, they are also very interesting. They may or may not come with EM counterpart. It depends on uh, various factors. It can depend on the mass ratio of the system, can depend on the equation state of the neutron star. We just don't know. So a, we are still looking for uh, the EM counterpart and uh, more study about them. So, so far, I already covered the three types of most promising gravitational wave sources for the ground-based detectors. And the reason for us to be most sensitive to these three types of sources is the following. Let's take a look at our uh, detector sensitivity. So what I'm, I'm showing you here is the noise curve of um, the LIGO detectors. It is showing you the noise level as a function of the gravitational wave frequencies in the horizontal axis. The lower the curve is, that means uh, we are um, better sensitive to that certain frequency. For typical stellar mass uh, black hole, black hole mergers, they uh, typically merge around say a few tens of hertz. Neutron star black holes merger, they merge at higher frequency, maybe a few hundred hertz. And for binary neutron star merger, they merge beyond a um, thousand hertz. But as you can see, for all these three types of sources, they spend um, most of their time, the in spiral merger and ring down phase within the sweet spot for LIGO and Virgo. And that's why they are kind of the ideal candidates for our detection and we already have some detection for them. Another thing you might notice when I uh, show you this plot is that the, the red curve, I'm labeling it O3, uh, that actually stands for the third observing rung for uh, LIGO and Virgo. 
and obviously we did have the first and second observing wrong with some um, uh, less sensitive detectors and we do have a lot of future upgrade plans for the detectors. It pushed the sensitivity all the way down. And just for you to get a sense of what, uh, what does these kind of upgrades mean in the future in terms of the total number of detection a year. Um, currently, LIGO Virgo just conclude our third observing round, the O3, is started since uh, 2019, since last year. And for current sensitivity, our uh, expectation um, for number of binary black holes merger a year is about few tens of them. And we also expect few binary neutron star merger a year. And it looks like we are actually on a good track. So um, the, the, the number of detection we have so far seems consistent with our expectation. That also implies our expectation for the astrophysical rate for this kind of binary merger seems, some, um, seems to be reasonable. And then down the road, we, um, go, we are going to upgrade our detector all the way to this so-called A-plus sensitivity. This is where the NSF funding guarantee up to. So that is a guarantee. We are go it, it's gonna happen in the next few years. And when we upgrade our detector up to that sensitivity, we would uh, expect about two order of magnitude more detection a year. And then all the way up, the, um, the community is trying to push this so-called 3G, the third generation detector. There are various different kinds of plans. For example, at the end of this bar, you see this Cosmic Explorer. That is the US-led um, um, efforts on the third generation detector. Um, uh, the counterpart of it is a European version of it, that's so-called the Einstein Telescope. Basically, all these different type of third generation detectors, the goal for it is that we would like to detect all the stellar mass binary mergers in the universe. And by the way, I should mention that um, all these number uh, were done by a calculator we built. There's also an online version of it that's at the bottom of the slides for you to play with. So if you're interested in this kind of number of binary merger detection calculation, you can go to this website for um, some um, easy calculation. And also just so you to get a sense that when this kind of third generation ground-based detector happen, the space-based gravitational detector LISA will also be launched around the same time scale. So, um, it's going to be bright. The future is going to be bright. We are going to have a lot of detection. And of course, there are a lot of science we can do with them. And the first type of scientific uh, field we can talk about is the gravitational wave cosmology, especially with this method, so-called the standard siren method. So um, I would like to say before I start this topic is that the gravitational cosmology, the role of gravitational wave in cosmology is not really trying to push the uh, precision of the cosmological measurement, at least not within next few years. We will not be able to compete with all the existing um, cosmological measurement. Instead, our um, major target is trying to provide an independent measurement so that we can talk about, maybe we can contribute to a question like this, like the tension in the Hubble constant. And that is our target. So we just want to make sure that we can provide an independent measurement with enough um, precision. And here is how we do it. So from the gravitational wave side, we provide a direct measurement of the luminosity distance to the gravitational wave source set. The luminosity distance goes inversely as the amplitude of the gravitational wave sources, uh, well, the, the gravitational wave signals. But as you can imagine, there are other physical or um, external parameters that could affect the amplitude you measure at the detectors, for example, the mass of the system, for example, the sky location of the system, and also even the binary orientation is gonna affect the amplitude you capture. 
But among these parameters, some of the parameters such as the mass, we actually can measure it from how the frequency of the gravitational signal evolve over time. So those kind of parameters, we can separate it out from the uh, amplitude measurement. But for some other parameter, for example, the binary orientation, whether they are a face on or edge on, this kind of parameter, we don't have good control of it. And that's why in the end, we can only marginalize over all the possibility, all the possible orientation. And this kind of marginalization actually contribute a lot to the uh, um, uncertainty of the distance measurement. And we are gonna come back to this later. Let's say now we have the distance measurement from the gravitational wave side. Um, standard cosmology help us to relate the distance of the astrophysical object to how fast, how fast the object's moving away from us due to the universe expansion. That's a redshift measurement, redshift z on the right hand side of this equation. This equation is described by um, a set of cosmological parameters, including h naught, omega matter, etc. And this is just one way of writing this down. And I should mention that since um, most of the LIGO Virgo detection, they are relatively local. So uh, we only have um, like best measurement of the leading order term um, um, among these cosmological parameters, which is the H0, the Hubble constant. So gravitational wave side, we provide the distance measurement. What's left to be determined is the redshift of the gravitational wave sources. And that is not easy. The um, standard uh, picture of this is that what we can do is that we just relate the gravitational wave sources to um, their host galaxies. Suppose we can uh, identify the host galaxy of the gravitational wave sources, then we can measure the redshift of the galaxy, then we get the um, redshift of the gravitational wave sources. However, the reality is not so ideal because that's because the LIGO Virgo detector, due to the limited number of detectors, we cannot provide very good localization of the, um, of the gravitational wave sources. So instead of single um, host galaxy we can identify, we actually provide a large localization volume. It's a three-dimensional volume on, on the sky. And there will be a lot of possible host galaxies within this volume. So that's not ideal, but well, you can still try to combine all of the possibility. And um, in the end, you, you're hoping that after you stack a lot of different uh, detection, then the correct value of um, the cos cosmological parameter you try to capture should stand out because others will just wash out as no like, a, like a noise. So that's what we call the statistical approach for uh, the standard siren uh, method. So of course, this is not an ideal um, way to do cosmology. It, 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 you can imagine when you have too many galaxies, you just don't have too much information out of it. And that's why a different um, approach of this is that if you have a gravitational detection and you also capture the electromagnetic counterpart, traditional telescope, they are able to do the localization much better than uh, the gravitational wave detectors. So they will help us to identify the uh, unique host galaxy, which is the, host, um, the real host of the, the gravitational wave sources, and we will capture the redshift of the host galaxies. And that's what we call the counterpart approach for this standard um, siren method. Um, and just to remind you, since we are talking about something that emit light as well, so we are talking about sources that that uh, such as the new the sources with a neutron star involved, for example, the binary neutron star mergers. And for this kind of counterpart approach, it has already been realized from the by the first um, gravitational wave detection of binary neutron star merger, the GDF seventeen O A seventeen. At the tip of this. Uh, a red arrow that is a kilonova emission. For this um, 
source, we have um, the LIGO Virgo measurement of distance to around 40 megaparsec. And the big block next to it, the host galaxies, has a redshift in terms of velocity of about 3,000 kilometer per second. Combining them, we have the first Hubble constant measurement of the, uh, the gravitational sources. And as you can see, that two um, straight bar, the green and the orange bar, that is the Planck and the supernova value. There's this four sigma um, um, tension between them. And our measurement, the blue curve, just cannot really um, say anything about this tension yet. However, after we combine more and more events like this, we should be able to reduce uncertainty of the Hubble constant. And here is a projection. So at the upper panel, I'm going to show you is the, um, the total number of detection we expect um, as a function of uh, years. So going to the right-hand side is going to the future. After you combine this event, the bottom um, panel is showing the, um, the precision of Hubble constant measurement, what Hubble constant measurement we expect after combining this event. And the projection is that we are gonna achieve few percent level of uh, Hubble constant measurement within a few years. In contrast, you uh, might still remember we mentioned this statistical method, which is combining all the possible host galaxies within the localization volume. That method actually doesn't require any EM counterpart. So the argument is that maybe we can apply it to the uh, big chunk of binary black holes merger we have, because we have a lot more binary black holes mergers than binary trans star mergers. But in the end, we found out that even if you do that, the Hubble constant measurement you're going to achieve is not going to be comparable to the uh, counterpart approach. And the reason for that is because the um, localization volume for the binary black holes mergers are typically too big. Like they are just much, much bigger than uh, a typical binary trans star merger localization. And that's mo uh, mostly because those binary black holes merger, they are too far away from us. We detect them much further away than a typical binary trans star merger. So uh, the volume is too big. There are too many um, possible galaxies lying within the volume. And turns out those binary black holes become useless. They, they don't provide um, um, minimal information about like they don't provide any uh, like real information for us to really constrain cosmology. So this comparison actually um, highlight the importance of the um, having the EM counterpart for gravitational wave cosmology. However, um, having the EM counterpart is not easy. I'm sure um, in the audience, there are a lot of people going to tell me more problems about uh, how difficult it is to capture the EM counterpart. But uh, as a theorist, I'm just going to uh, summarize it into two points. So no cloud on the sky, for example. Um, the first problem is that I already mentioned that we just don't know where the gravitational wave sources are on the sky. Our localization volume is just too big. So we don't know where to point your telescope. Second problem is that the typical EM counterpart we are talking about, they don't last forever. They uh, fade away. So in order to capture the EM counterpart, you actually have to point your telescope at the right, to the right direction at the right time. And uh, that is just not easy. And there are several things we can try to help on this problem. For example, from the uh, LIGO Virgo side, been working with a collaborator within the collaboration, we try to um, generate the sky localization map as soon as possible, so that uh, right now we actually can produce a sky map uh, about a second after the, the pipeline captures the signal, captures the gravitational signal. So that problem kind of helped. Another um, method I just tried to, uh, I would like to mention today is this, what they call the gravitational wave weather forecast. And when you see this term, this is what you should have in mind. Like this is what we can do is that we actually can uh, forecast 
from where on the sky the gravitational events most likely come at a given time. And the reason we can do that is actually because of two interesting characteristics about our detectors. The first one, I would call it a spatial selection effect. So uh, you see these two um, blue lines on the screen that represent the two arms of our um, interferometer, our detectors. Our detector is not uh, homogeneously uh, sensitive across the sky. So, so the sensitivity is not like this. It's not, it's not homogeneous. Instead, there are some kind of sh elongated shape. We are more sensitive to sources right above and below the interferometer plane. It just looks like a peanut. And when you try to project this peanut patterns onto the sky, you would expect to hot spot on the sky. And that is uh, the, 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 red, the red hot spot on this plot. So th that is where um, you expect most of the gravitational detection is going to come from because we are more sensitive to those two directions. However, this is only an instantaneous projection. As you know, the LIGO, Virgo are uh, ground-based detectors. We are attached to the Earth. The Earth rotates over time. So after 24 hours, these patterns also rotate and they kind of average out. And that's why after 24 hours, you don't really see too much contrast between a different part of the sky. You only see a little bit of contrast between different uh, latitudes. And this is where the second selection effect of our detectors um, plays a role. That's what we call a temporal selection effect. So if we, if we look into the archival data of our detectors, we actually notice that over 24 hours, uh, that's a horizontal axis, the detectors tend to be more sensitive at night than day around the observatory. Um, there is a big contrast about like a factor of two uh, difference between a night and day. And this kind of diurnal cycle is um, the reason for this very simple, it's just because the humans sleep at night. And when humans sleep, we produce less ambient noise for the detector. And that's easier for us to uh, keep the detector uh, stable and being able to observe. So that's why when we try to, again, come back to this 24 hours average, uh, you, you, would not, you will want to um, uh, fold in this diurnal cycle. So you, you will want to wait each different hours differently, depend on whether it's more, li more likely to be sensitive or not. And when you do that, you will uh, start to see this kind of hub spot again. So this is a projection for uh, one day. If we can make a projection for one day, then of course we can make a projection for different months over the years. So this is our uh, projection. And this kind of projection is very useful for um, um, EM telescope trying to capture especially those short duration EM counterpart of gravitational wave. Because for those kind of short duration emission, you cannot really turn your telescope after you, you receive a LIGO Virgo alert. Instead, you will want to point your telescope more or less to about the right direction so that you can wait there and, and maximize your chance of uh, capturing the EM counterpart. And that's why uh, this kind of um, patterns has already been implemented, for example, on the SWIFT telescope. All right, so now I would like to bring your, your attention back um, to this gravitational cosmology. We've mentioned a few percent measurement of Hubble constant uh, um, in the earlier slides, but we actually can do better. And when you think about this question of how can we do better, you have to ask what contribute most to your Hubble constant measurement uncertainty. And it turns out to be the distance uncertainty is not good. It is the gravitational wave side. The distance measurement is just not good. And what contribute 
most to your distant uncertainty turns out to be this so-called the distance inclination degeneracy. So it is because we don't know the inclination of the binary, we cannot have good measurement of the distance. And what this degeneracy is, is, is the following. Um, the binary can have all kinds of inclination. It can be a phase on binary on the left hand side, which means the rotational axis parallel to your line of sight. Or it can be the edge on binary, so where the rotational axis is um, perpendicular to your line of sight. When everything else are the same, um, the phase on binary tends to give us um, stronger gravitational signal than an edge on binary. And the reason for that is because the gravitational signal for a given binary system are uh, highest uh, are strongest along their rotational axis. So phase on binary give a stronger signal. However, when you receive a certain gravitational signal at your, at your detectors, you don't really know whether the signal came from a phase on binary that is far away or an edge on binary that's close by. And that's why uh, you will have this degeneracy between distant and binary inclinations. And one very naive way of breaking this degeneracy is just trying to um, measure this binary inclination from some external sources. For example, again, the EM counterpart of the, of the binary mergers. Because the EM counterpart for uh, many models are, are suggesting that um, if you are, you are observing the binary merger from different angles, you would expect different kind of EM emission. Maybe there are different colors, different strengths, or different magnitude, for example. So um, by having this EM um, observation, um, the EM side can provide us some constraint on the viewing angle of the binary system. And let's say if we have that, we will be, ab we will be able to um, push down the distance uncertainty. And here in the plot, I'm showing you, um, say, a thousand different simulation. And uh, right now, I'm only showing you the case where we don't have any um, constraint and what, how well we can constrain the distance. The uncertainty lies around, well, it's widely spread. It lies around, say, 15 to 20%. But when you start to have some kind of information on the binary viewing angle, you will be able to push the uncertainty down. Depending on how well you can constrain that binary inclination, you can push it down by a factor of two to three. And this, this distant uncertainty, you actually can directly view it as a Hubble constant uncertainty because this is what contributes most to your Hubble constant uncertainty. If for individual uh, gravitational event, you are able to push the uncertainty down by a factor of two to three. After you combine event, the overall uncertainty in Hubble constant goes inversely as root n, where n is number, total number of detection. Then a factor of two to three improvements telling you, you will only need a factor of five to 10 fewer event to achieve the same Hubble constant precision um, if the viewing angle is constrained. So this is one possibility for us to get a better Hubble constant measurement precision. Another uh, direction is that we can turn our in, uh, attention to this new type of detection, the neutron star black holes mergers. What's great about this kind of system um, is that well, first of all, they have, a new, uh, they have a neutron star inside the system. They can possibly emit light because the neutron star can be tidally disrupted by the black holes and, and that can power up the EM emission. Another great thing about this kind of system is that the, the distant inclination degeneracy can be broken by the observation of first, the merger ring down, and second, the precession. So first, let's uh, pay attention on the merger ring downs observation. If you remember this plot I show you at the beginning of the, 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 the talk, 
For a typical binary neutron star merger, they merge beyond a thousand hertz. And actually, um, the LIGO Virgo detector are not so sensitive to sources beyond a thousand hertz. So uh, most of the um, for, for most of the um, signal to noise ratio we capture within the detector come from the in spiral part of the binary neutron star mergers signal. We don't really capture the merger and ring down part. However, for a neutron star black hole merger, they merge at lower frequency. So we can capture all three phase, the in spiral phase merger and the ring down phases. And when we talk about this um, um, distant inclination degeneracy, that applies to the in spiral part. The merger and ring down part actually have different dependency on the binary inclination. So by capturing that part, it gives us extra information. It's independent information on the binary inclination. And those information help. So here is how much it helps. So here is, again, the um, uh, distant uncertainty. And it, the black line showing you the distant uncertainty for a binary neutron star merger, while the green is a neutron star black hole merger. Um, so you can see, having the merger and ring down part, the neutron star black hole merger can give us better measurement on the distance. So that is one great thing about neutron star black hole merger. Another great thing about this kind of system is that, well, there is a black hole, and the black hole can have spin, like a, the, the blue arrow there. If this blue arrow, if the direction of this um, spinning misaligned from the total angular momentum of the system, which is the yellow arrow, then the entire system will go through a precession. And this kind of precession will allow us to um, measure some kind of extra gravitational wave mode that again have different dependency on the binary inclination. And having that independent information can totally break down this distant inclination degeneracy. So here's a comparison for system with and without precession. And also this blue set of curve is a um, system with stronger precession. So as you can see, having precession uh, observation, we will be able to almost completely break down this uh, distant inclination degeneracy and get much, much better distance measurement. Some people argue that maybe, well, so far we haven't had have solid detection of neutron star black holes merger yet. Maybe we just don't have that many neutron star black holes in the universe. However, uh, after having this study, we found out that the um, difference between the system with precession and the binary neutron star merger are just too big, that the difference in this and uncertainty is just too big. So as long as the universe can generate one neutron star black hole merger like this for every 10 binary neutron star merger, Neutron star black hole merger could be a better candidate to do cosmology, to do gravitational wave cosmology. So this could possibly be our future hope. Okay, sorry, that is, yeah, okay. So um, finally, I would like to mention this different um, approach, um, different things we can do with this uh, binary neutron star mergers. So there's an extra difference between um, uh, binary black hole merger and binary neutron star merger. Not only that the binary neutron, binary neutron star merger are bright in electromagnetic wave, and also the binary neutron star merger, they could be tidally deformed by each other's um, gravitational wave field. So they have tied inside their um, gravitational wave signal. Those tied in, will imprint in our gravitational wave signal. How much these the neutron stars are deformed by each other actually depends on the equation of state of the uh, nuclear matter inside the neutron star. So having the tide, uh, in, um, having, having the observation of the tide inside the gravitational signal actually give us some constraint on the equation of state of neutron star. And we would expect that after we have more and more binary neutron star merger detection, we will get better and better constraint on the uh, equation of state of the nuclear matter. 
And that is something uh, nuclear physicists are very interested in because in a, a, a typical neutron star, they are a very low temperature, but very high density. And that is a corner on the QCD diagram that just uh, has a lot of mystery. We just don't know. We cannot do any uh, um, experiment on Earth to figure out the equation of state at, those, at that corner. So neutron stars turns out to be a very ideal um, lab for us to uh, understand the equation of state for, uh, nuclear ma for, for matter around that corner. So in addition to the equation of state of neutron star, there are other questions we can ask, we can learn from this kind of tidal observation. For example, we can ask, um, were these, were those observations really um, composed of two neutron stars? Or could it be actually one neutron star and one black hole? Because actually in this kind of neutron star black holes merger, they also uh, could have the tidal effect because there is a neutron star, they could have tide. However, when you really ask the difference between two neutron star merger and one neutron star, one black hole mergers, um, you would expect that when you have two neutron stars, the tidal effect should be larger than a neutron star black hole mergers. When you only look at single event, actually the difference is not very big. So, for example, take the GDF 17 OS 17, for example. When we look at the tidal uh, when the tides, when I look, when we look at the tidal deformability, so that is the parameter we actually measure tide from, it's not very different but, um, from um, a two neutron star scenario or one neutron star and one black hole scenario. It's just not clear from single event observation. And that's why we propose that in the future, we actually can look at a lot of this kind of system. Let's say all of these future systems, they all have tide. They all show tide inside their signal. However, you notice that there's one of them to show you, well, lower tide, the, it, it, the, the, it, the system seems calmer than others. Then that is possibly a signature of having a neutron star, a black hole, a system inside uh, the population. So after you combine event, you might start to um, constrain, so for example, the population of neutron star black holes inside a lot of low mass binary mergers detections. Another question you can possibly ask is that whether these um, nuclear matter inside the neutron star go through a phase transition. So the scenario is the following. Um, this nuclear matter, when they uh, go through a high density, when, when they lie within high density environment, it is possible that this nuclear matter will go through a phase transition. And especially at the center of a neutron star, it is extremely high density environment. So possibly you can have phase transition of the matter. Um, uh, it will go from nuclear matter become, a, for example, a quark matter. And you will form a quark matter core at the center of a neutron star. So there will be two layer of the, of the structures inside the neutron star. So um, when there is a quark matter core present inside a neutron star, the equation of state you measure and also the tide you measure from the gravitational signal will be different. It will actually be smaller than a typical um, nuclear, like in the, the pure nuclear matter neutron star system. And that's why, again, and also, oh, another thing that's interesting is that um, also, the bigger the neutron star is, you can imagine the density at the center is becoming higher, and therefore you would expect more matter go through the, um, the, the phase transition. So what you can do is actually, you look at the tidal, um, the tidal signal inside the gravitational wave signal, and you try to look at their, their dependency on the mass of the neutron star. Let's say you really notice uh, beyond certain uh, mass of the neutron star, the tide of the system start to go down as a function of mass. Then one possible explanation for this is that maybe 
um, there is a phase transition happen in between the system. And that transition is the critical mass for the phase transition to happen. So for both type of the scenario I mentioned, we found out that you only need about a few to about 100 of um, detection for us to really verify or um, exclude this scenario. So there are a lot to do with this kind of um, different um, question you can ask from the tidal um, observation. So that is comes to uh, my summary. I hope I convince you that gravitational wave can actually serve as an independent probe to uh, the universe. And EM counterpart is very important for gravitational wave cosmology. And finally, there are more we can learn, we can possibly learn about these, um, um, the property of the matter at high density and low temperatures um, from the observation of neutron star mergers. And that's it, thanks. Okay, thank you so much for a very nice talk. I think we can all push the button and just thank you. So uh, I think we have a couple of minutes for a few questions. Is there any question from audience? Okay, again, is there any question? You can raise hand to ask question if you have any. Any unclear or not clear point or suggestion? Uh, hi, Rati, this is Anna. Hi. Oh, good. Yeah, please go ahead. Yeah, hi. Thank you for a really nice talk. Um, I have a couple of questions about the uh, sort of operations of LIGA. Um, you mentioned that the NSF is funding um, through the A plus level, uh, which would bring a lot more events. Uh, and I was just wondering how technologically challenging uh, uh, will those upgrades be? Is the technology already there and it's just like a matter of implementing them or, um, or is there more development that needs to be done to reach those sorts of um, levels of precision? Um, yeah, so, um, yeah, so we do have technology challenge, but uh, for all the way to A plus, it looks like um, uh, um, it is doable from the experimental side. So several challenge, including, um, for example, there are gases inside our tunnel. Um, so which means so, so the tunnel is a, a vacuum. It's a, we try to keep it vacuum. However, over time there can be gas leak into the tunnel. And those kind of gas is very, very difficult for us to remove. When you have those gas present, then the laser light going through the tunnel will be scattered by those gas, those, those, those depend on what kind of gas you have. Typically, maybe the waters are inside. Then they will um, produce scattered light and that will disturb our signal when, they, when we recombine it at the end of the interferometers. So that is one problem. Another problem could be um, the coating problem. So in our mirrors, we have a coating on it, but that coating is trying to help us to uh, reduce, for example, the um, thermal, um, thermal noise, because when you have a laser light hitting on a mirror, that will um, heat up the mirror and that will give us some extra noise. So you will need a, a good coating to really reduce those kind of thermal noise. And people are still trying to find out, for example, the best way to, um, to um, deviate those um, thermal noise. So, so you need some better coating, for example. And at, when we push down, for example, on the low frequency side, that is uh, important, for example, for the binary black holes merger detections, then we will start to uh, have the problem of uh, more and more uh, seismic noise. And for those, um, well, at some point, we will just not, we, we already try to isolate our interferometer as much as possible, but there is always a limit for that. Um, so, yeah, there are plenty of problems, but uh, people are still doing R&D work trying to um, keep this going. But maybe you already heard of the quantum uh, squeezing technique, trying to um, um, improve the um, 
um, performance on both low and high frequency side. So yeah, it is still going. Yeah, thanks. That's very interesting. Um, okay, I don't see other raised hands, so I'll just ask my second question. Um, so I also really like the uh, like those sensitivity maps that you showed, where um, the events are more likely to be detected on the sky, and it looked like like during the summer months that um, those hot spots were sort of where the galactic plane is. Um, and so I assume those would be kind of hard to follow up, um, like to follow up extra galactic sources there. So I was just wondering, are there any plans to sort of um, observe uh, in the months where those hot spots are, are more readily uh, observable? Yeah, so that is actually uh, a good point. We are trying to, uh, what we are trying to show there exactly, we overlay the, the um, galactic plan so that people know that at certain months of the year, uh, the, the, de the detection is more likely to come um, from the, the galactic plan. So yes, those amongst will be more difficult for EM observer. But uh, what LIGO's observ uh, operation, we are trying to keep it uh, for years long. So we don't really have um, too much interruption between um, different months. So we try to keep it operating all the time. And um, another thing you could, uh, well, yeah, so, so we don't really, um, incorporate that into our operation um, schedule, actually. It's just um, we could expect other um, discovery during those months as well, for example, discovery for the binary black holes merger or even supernova. So yeah, we did not take that into account for the operation. Sure, thanks. Okay, is there any other questions? Oh, good. I see a couple of more questions. So, Knight, please go ahead. Hi, yeah. Um, so, just following up from uh, Anna's question, actually, I was wondering if um, there are potentials for like new sources of uh, annoyances and uh, problems that you all would need to work around, given the upgrades that you're planning to make uh, uh, to the next generations of these detection experiments. So, for example, there's you know, operating at higher laser power and stuff like that, bring in its own issues that you all would need to fight against? Yeah, so for for example, there are, as the sensitivity we've been put pushing um, down for especially for the low frequency, in addition to the seismic noise I just mentioned, another um, noise come from, we call it a Newton, Newtonian noise, that is basically the the limit for all the ground-based um, detectors. And those Newtonian noise come from, for example, the, <coughs> excuse me, for example, the wind is just moving around. It's a big block of air mass moving around and we just cannot uh, really mitigate it. So that mm -hmm. is actually, that set, that set the bottom floor of our ground-based detector and for to 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 um, mitigate that, we can only go to the space, for example. I see. All right. Thank you very much. That's interesting to hear about. Hmm. Okay. Great. Is there any other questions? Okay. I don't see any other hands. Actually, I have a very quick question, if that's possible. Sure. Yeah, so actually, can you go to your uh, last item when you were like a core formation? I was wondering, uh, maybe you already said, I didn't notice, uh, do you also talk about the connection of that core with the equation of a state of neutron star binaries? The black hole with equation state, that's your question? Yeah, I mean, just I'm, I'm just saying that the connection between, about this core formation, about, I mean, how do you connect it with the equation of a state of each of these individual stars? Oh, whether you have hard or soft or oh i see so so the equation of state of uh, nuclear so equation of state for neutron star um the general thought is that there is only one equation of state so no matter uh, how the neutron star were formed 
there is they, they you are gonna only form one type of neutron star they're just gonna have different mass for example and different mass might lead to different amount of material that goes through phase transition if it really goes through a phase transition but um, the formation scenario is not gonna change your equation of state of the neutron star does that answer your question Partially, but if you have like a soft or hard neutron stars, does it uh, doesn't it have any like a differences or I don't know? Maybe we can discuss later. Do you see my point, right? Um, maybe we can discuss later because yeah. um, yeah, because um, yeah, it's, no matter how they were formed, um, there will be only one uh equation of state because that's that's the like fundamental property for the nuclear matter. So, so there is only one possibility. We just don't know which one it is. Yeah, exactly, that's, that's my point, right? So I'm just saying that uh, before their formation, is there any like probability of like picking up which one is gonna to better show up if I want to ask differently? Um, or maybe we are better to postpone. Yeah, yeah, I think, yeah. Um, yeah, I guess the answer is no, but yeah, we can continue this uh, after the talk. Okay, good. Yeah. Okay, great. So, is there any other question that somebody want to, uh, to ask? Okay, nice. If not, let's thank our speaker again, and thank you so much again for a very fascinating talk. Okay, bye everybody. Thank you.